And so hello again, welcome back. We're going to continue our discussion on uh, turbulence modeling, specifically LES modeling in uh, dynamic Smarkorinsky uh, modeling. And so we were talking about filters because we need to revisit them. And we saw that uh, the basic way to separate large eddies from medium and small is to separate them by frequency. And so uh, small eddies will usually correspond to higher frequency. So that's why you see them on this part of the spectrum. Medium will be somewhere here and large will be somewhere here. Okay, so the thing about that uh, separating by frequency is that, uh, well, if you were tr to try and use a box filter, for example, uh, it will only capture, you know, one sort of frequency, but it will kind of uh, have this wavy pattern, which kind of mixes in you know other so-called resonant frequencies as well okay so let's say you could fit in one frequency like this you could also fit in two frequencies like this all right so where the the length equals the uh, the length of the box for example could be equals to n times the number of wavelength so that's that's uh that's how you can fit in multiple uh, frequencies in this box filter. So the converse is that you try to do this, uh, this uh, what do you call that, uh, box filter in the frequency mode. So that means you want to have sharp cut off frequency somewhere. And then what you have is that in the space domain, it will be like so, like this, this very, very wavy pattern. So those those will be good for you know having cut special cut off over here, but uh, not good for uh, the space filtering because it'll give you this wavy sort. The best the best compromise between both is the Gaussian filter, which is the normal distribution, because it has roughly the same shape in space domain and frequency domain. So if you have this G function uh, in a space domain, so instead of having the box filter, you have a Gaussian filter. Gaussian filter. All right. And in the, in the uh, frequency domain, where you are trying to cut off certain frequencies, it will still look like this bell-shaped curve. Okay. So this is k delta, where this is uh, the, the cutoff wave number times some filter length. All right, okay, so this is the g in the frequency domain. Okay, and so th this is the averaging function you use for each frequency. So let's say in low frequencies, you don't want so much. Closer to your target frequency, you want to give it a little more averaging weight. So if you remember while I was talking about this G function, which is this uh, filter function, some people call it a convolution kernel. Don't know why, but uh, don't worry about it. It's just the, the formal name for it. It's called convolution kernel. Whenever you see this G, the professional name is called convolution kernel. Okay. Professional name is called convolution kernel. Um, so, uh, you, closer to the frequency, you give it more weighted average. Further away, you do you give it an exponentially decaying weighted average. So the the thing is that the Gaussian filter is a very nice balance between this space filtering and frequency filtering. So you won't get a sharp cut off here. Sometimes you get a you you have this gentle sort of cut off. Right, there's a gentle slant down. Okay, so when you do this filtering, you get uh, you model a small filter using a new SGS, which is the subgrid uh, viscosity. Sometimes I just equivalently call it the turbulent kinematic viscosity. They're very similar in concept, they're not exactly the same. There's a lot of new ones there, but uh, in terms of, I mean, for engineering understanding. Uh, I'm not going to draw too much of a difference between them, okay? Because, uh, yeah. So, you wanted to guess a CD here, right? 
So what do you do uh, to try and guess this CD? I mean, that's the goal of this uh, whole filtering process. All right. So you have, remember, your filtered Navier-Stokes equations, which will be over here. Your filtered Navier-Stokes equations will be this, this segment of the graph. And then the stuff that you model is with this. All right. So this uh, new T equals to 2CD or some CD delta squared into some uh, uh, stress strain uh, uh, strain rate right so we want to guess this CD how are we going to do it well um, the idea is to filter again here okay so this is the part where we are we solve our filtered Navier Stokes equation okay so this is the part that's actually being resolved in the in the equation this is what's being modeled so um, what you do is to filter the filtered navier stokes again so you do the filtering process again here so you do a second filter and what is the purpose of this second filter the second filter is to uh, sort of separate out these medium eddies and you try and get some sort of you try and find the new t here and then you say that oh this this from this new t you can sort of get a dynamic coefficient right because uh you're not actually this you actually know the velocities here after you solve your equation so you kind of know your you know your new t here exactly and from that you can sort of uh, yeah you can sort of guess this CD here. So what you do is that you have this new T here. I mean, I'm just giving you a rough, 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 uh, what do you call that, conceptual overview. You get a CD into a delta square, but this delta is like a different delta because since uh, you're trying to get the medium eddies so-called out, you need to enlarge. You have to have a bigger filter width. Okay, bigger filter width. Bigger filter width. Okay, so you have to get a bigger filter width and then you relate it to some sort of mean strain rate. Something like that. It's not exact, but the concept is very similar. So, uh, yeah, this is what you model. Okay, and this will be the double filter strain rate. Okay, so it's double filtering double filter okay so have a double filter strain rate a double filter bandwidth a filter width a, a second filter width so you can sort of extract this coefficient out and what is this new t okay what is this new t over here well this new t you can actually you can compute you know you know this exact value okay this is the medium the medium uh what do you call it eddy viscosity so to speak or rather the the subgrid stress you already know this value exactly so after you filter it out you would know this terms exactly and then you also know this filter width which you're giving you know this uh, strain rate so in theory you could know this as well and the assumption is that this CD here it's going to be equal it's going to be equal to this CD over here so that is the sort of similarity modeling we are talking about here but to do this in in the equations you kind of have to be very familiar with your filtering so we we went through a lot of we went through some of this because this is uh, you know, this is just some overview background you don't need to know it too much in detail because we didn't specify what kind of filters we are using but uh, we can sort of know or conceptually this Gaussian filter can work 
in helping you separate these frequencies well okay reasonably well and it has a good compromise with this box filter because it has this very localized velocity as well okay there may be some other filters but i'm not going to talk about them here um, so but the rough idea is maybe you use a gaussian filter you filter this equation once and then you solve this equation this navier stokes this filtered navier stokes equation in your cfd code and once you do that you filter you filter the solved equations again to get these medium interactions so that you you have a sort of uh, kinematic turbulent viscosity turbulent kinematic viscosity this turbulent kinematic viscosity for which you would use to determine this cd based on what you already know based on what you already know and then you take this cd and then you plug it into your small uh, small uh, model for small uh, turbulent uh, subgrid scale uh, viscosity turbulent uh, kinematic viscosity yeah so that's the basic basic idea now to do it in math uh, in terms of math it will be a slightly uh, more complicated somewhat more complicated in fact so yeah uh, we'll need to uh, go into that okay so um, all right i'll just copy and paste uh, all of this here and yeah so this this is what uh what we have we see here that the velocity has a supervision uh a superposition of a big and a smaller sine waves so big sine waves usually correspond to low frequency okay big sine waves usually correspond to low frequency Low, uh, small sine waves correspond to high frequency. This is what I mean by small. These are high frequency. The correct terms high frequency. So big eddies also correspond to uh, low frequency. Small eddies correspond to big frequency. So this is the spectrum we are talking about. And uh, okay. So remember, okay, I forgot to mention one thing. We wanted to filter a first time using for this to separate between the large medium and small so to separate between this group here and this group here you needed to use a filter so the filter width will be something like delta to filter a second time you need to use a larger filter because uh, you want to capture the so-called medium eddies as well okay so this may be this second filter size maybe equals to 2 delta that's the general way you do it i mean most people when they introduce this concept to you they will say this second filter width is about 2 delta okay okay so filtering does this to the spectrum and this this second filter this second filter okay i should put this Okay, the second filter is um, okay. The process of filtering a second time to get the CD. Okay, CD. The coefficient is known as test filtering. Okay, this is called test filtering. So in in a lot of uh, LES uh, documentation, you will see this term called test filtering. So test filtering is just filtering this spectrum again, so that you can test, you can test for this CD, this CD uh, value, the dynamic coefficient based on you know, this uh, new T, and then we can, uh, can plug this CD into here. That's the idea behind test filtering and dynamic modeling in general so we need to talk about now that we talk about it at least you know conceptually we've seen how it uh, how filtering sort of cuts up this spectrum and um, now we need to actually talk about filtering more mathematically so that we know actually you know, how do we get this CD over here and what are the real equations being used here I mean may not necessarily be what I'm pointing out here 
it, but that helps to uh, introduce you to the concept okay so um, now we talk about uh, filtering briefly we not we need to talk about it more mathematically so if you recall our uh, previous videos we had a very very basic introduction to filtering it's just enough to get some conceptual understanding but it's not quite enough to go through the math so you know now we need to go through the hard math part because we need to do this double filtering process or test filtering okay so we need to uh, go back go back to our Navier-Stokes equation again okay so this is a recap of our Navier-Stokes equation they may be written in vector form like so okay they may be written in vector form like so this is uh, for uh, incompressible Navier-Stokes equation okay so if it's uh, if it's this in this uh, form in Einstein notation it may be in this you may see Navier-Stokes equation being written like so now uh, let's compare term by term so this this term usually corresponds to this term here where is the time derivative and the convection term here however of course you actually bring this uj out why can you bring this uj out usually it's because of the continuity equation but the reason why we leave it in is because we need to do uh, filtering first we don't want to cancel off any terms that after we filter uh, we might end up with some extra terms i'll show you what that means in a while okay then we have our pressure term uh, of course I divided it throughout by the density here and then this is our uh, momentum diffusion term or the viscosity term um, where we have this del ui del xj del uj del xi now usually this term will also disappear the reason is because uh, again of the continuity equation all right so um, I'll show you what that means in a while but just bear with me for the time being okay and then this is the gi which is the gravity now in most navier stokes equation we just ignore the gravity altogether so let's go step by step so uh, this is the continuity equation if you have a constant density you just have this del ui del xi equals zero hopefully you are already familiar with einstein notation so we don't have to worry about it so uh, for our analysis, we need to be more familiar with these two terms and how to apply the filter properly. Okay, we need to apply the filter properly. Okay, so in case you are confused about some of the notation, if you see Sij, Sij is actually equals to half of this, this term inside. Some people use the notation like this, the vector notation. This is actually the um, the uh, divergence of velocity. It's a oh no, not divergence, gradient of velocity. So this is a, a gradient of a vector. It will give you a tensor actually, and this is the deviatroic part. What is a deviatroic part? Okay, this is a. Oh no, it's not the deviatroic part. This is a transpose. Transpose. All right. So I'll show you what that means. Okay. So gradient of velocity is equal like that. Okay. So um, just just want you to be clear on this notation first before we go any further. If you are familiar, you can just skip this part. Maybe go on to the next video or something. Okay. But I'll just do it for the sake of just being clear. So this is the gradient of velocity. This is what it looks like. So normally, you know, the velocity vector is like Vx, Vy, and Vz. So gradient is you do a del by del x, del by del y, and del by del z. So how do you do the gradient of this velocity? Okay, how do you do this gradient of velocity? So <clears throat> if you remember, I mean, your multivariable calculus is usually the del by del x, del by del y, and del by del z. Okay? So, let's say you have a gradient of something. Let's say, uh, we call this the gradient of some, let's say, the uh, u velocity, uh, x velocity, for example. 
you have a partial by partial x of the uh, ux partial by partial y of the ux and then partial by partial z of the ux of the ux right so you have to do this for the y and z okay so we'll do it for y and z because there are three neighbor stokes equations one for each uh, coordinate in the uh, x in the uh, 3D space. So there's x, y, and z in the Cartesian form. So I'm not going to go spherical or anything. Don't overcomplicate things here. So this is the z direction. z, z, and z. Now when I use the v here and u here, they are kind of interchangeable. They just talk about the uh, velocity in the x, y, and z direction. Now usually this thing, you would just plop it, prop it into your Navier-Stokes equation in the x, in the x uh, direction, in the, in the first equation so-called. You, you put this vector into, let's say the x, you put this vector into the, the uh, x momentum balance of the Navier-Stokes equation. You put this, um, uh, velocity gradient into the y direction of the 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 y velocity uh, momentum equation a y momentum equation and likewise you put this gradient delta u z into the z uh, velocity uh, z momentum equation now the thing is that if you were to uh, represent it across all three uh, all three uh, what do you call that on three directions you need three gradients in three directions so this one will go in the x uh, x uh, momentum equation this one will go in the y momentum equation this one will go in the z momentum equation how are you going to represent these vectors okay and when you combine all three uh, all three Navier-Stokes equation into one so the answer for us is just to use a tensor so the tensor I mean in general uh, is like that, uh, or a 3x3 three three kind of a matrix kind of thing. I'm not going to go into detail on uh, the actual mathematics of tensors and vectors. That is a very big can of worms. I don't know want to open that up. But okay, just want you to notice the patterns here, just for practical purposes. So you notice in the x, in the x, uh, the x equation, they usually uh, corresponds to the first row. So the first row has three vector uh, three uh, components here down by their x of vx down by their y of vx down by their z of vx likewise for the y okay so this is like the first row of this uh, matrix or this tensor it's uh, we will have of course the 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 stuff that will appear in the x momentum balance the second the second part will appear these terms will appear in the y momentum balance. These ones, these three, and of course the last row will appear in the z momentum balance. So hopefully that helps you to know how this del uh, gradient of velocity, why does it, uh, how these terms actually come about. So it's very hard to, again, the idea is that it's very hard to, for us to put uh, three column vectors into one very long column vector. So the idea is to, instead of just having uh, you know, uh, column vectors uh, in one dimension, you need to have it in two dimension to handle all this complexity together. Okay, so this is the, uh, the gradient of u in three dimensions. So you have the x vector, the y vector, and the z vector. So transposing it will be very much similar. You just swap the terms over here. Okay, so you swap the diagonal terms along this, this part, you get the transpose. Nothing too much over there. And you add them together, you have this Sij. So Sij equals to half of this gradient of velocity plus its transpose. And you this is what is known as the string rate tensor. So to 
to get it in a very compact way of writing, we can do it like so. Del ui del xj, del uj del xi. Why is it written like so? Well, um, suppose that, uh, yeah, this is actually a shorthand uh, for 3 by 3 matrix of column uh, row i. So this, the first i, i corresponds to the row, j corresponds to the column. Okay, so for example, let's say you have u equals to 1, j, uh, i equals to 1, j equals to 1. So it will have del by del x of vx plus del by del x of vx, all right? So if, so this is how we, how we get the notation here, all right? Uh, let's say i equals 1 j equal 1 so s11 one one, so that's just pure substitution is equals to this u1 x1 u1 x1 okay so that that's just equals to now u1 now x1 or if you want to use more familiar coordinate system, you just say del u del x. Okay, because x1 corresponds to x, x2 corresponds to y, x3 corresponds to z, and likewise u1 corresponds to the u velocity, uh, the x velocity, u2 corresponds to y velocity, u3 corresponds to z velocity. Okay, so I'll stop now. Don't uh, drag on this too long. In the next video, I'll continue on the strain rate tensor, okay? And then hopefully we can talk about the filtering aspect as well. Thanks for watching. I'll see you guys again. Bye-bye.